This is going to be the most amazing panel. You understand that, right? We live in revolutionary times. We live in, in revolutionary city. And we have the revolutionary panelists. I'm just here to moderate and keep them in line. But you are going to be part of this uh, powwow here. So it's going to be very interactive. On Slido, for after they do quick introductions, I'd like you to start putting up themes that you want us to riff off of. We have some questions that we prepared. Uh, on blockchain and cryptocurrencies in general, but you might have some things that we haven't thought of that's highly likely. So keep us honest, keep us focused on what you want to know about. That's the point of this, to get some value to you. Speaking of value, how many of you are owners of, let's call it, anything crypto? Hi, hi, be proud. The FBI is not around here. Don't worry about it. <laughs> SEC is far, far away. Not so we should keep them, but that's my political persuasion. Um, how about, has anybody participated in doing their own ICO yet? Any entrepreneurs who've done their own? Yes, two, awesome here. And how many have per bought ICO as a consumer or investor? Okay, fascinating, fascinating. Your names will all be reported at the end of the day <laughs> to Washington. All right, um, let's start. Jeff Aru, why don't you start off? Um, so I'm Jeff Stewart, um, sort of a serial entrepreneur, uh, seed stage investor, and uh, started, a, a fin started a series of fintech companies. Um, and uh, I got my first Bitcoin at $11. Uh, unfortunately, I went big in Mt. Gox. So uh, it's not as good a story as, as you might like. What and were then, you buying on Mt. Gox, Jeff? Bitcoins. Oh, uh-huh. Um, <laughs> uh, and then uh, uh, this last summer, although I'd been involved in fintech, for a while, this summer, um, uh, just was amazed at how fast the ICO marketplace was evolving and went all in, 100-hour work weeks, really understanding the whole tokenization, especially as it relates to security tokens and the capital markets. Awesome. Patrick. My name is Patrick Barron. I am CEO of Ambisafe Financial, based here in San Francisco. Uh, we have about 100 employees worldwide between our group of companies, and our purpose is to help companies either tokenize their business model or help entrepreneurs through the ICO process. So we help with consulting, uh, making introductions, as well as providing all of the technology needed to uh, facilitate a successful token sale. And uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Elise. Good afternoon. My name is Elise Colleen. It's a pleasure to be here in this room today, especially with folks so excited about cryptocurrency. Um, my background is in uh, the life sciences and in stats. And from there, I went into venture capital prior to Bitcoin and have been in the, the VC field for about the last six or seven years before starting my own practice in 2016. Um, I was one of the earliest investors in the blockchain space and beginning in 2013 or earliest traditional investors, and started looking at ICOs as a VC that same year, so in 2013 and 14. Um, it's been lovely to see the industry evolve, and um, excited for our today's discussion. And Bart Stevens. Great, thank you. I'm Bart Stevens. I'm one of the uh, founding managing partners of Blockchain Capital. We're based here in San Francisco in the Ferry Building, and we've been uh, investing in the blockchain technology sector and the cryptocurrency ecosystem. For going on five years, we've raised and deployed uh, three funds. We're currently raising our fourth fund, and we have a portfolio of about 75 companies, um, and that's around the world. Um, we became intrigued with ICO technology. We backed one of the first ICOs, uh, probably the same one that we did, uh, called MasterCoin. It didn't work, but it got us thinking about you know, ICOs in general, and so in April of this year, we uh, invented the security token. Ours is, is a VC token, so it gives holders essentially a digital, tradable, blockchain-based financial product. Um, so they are a limited partner uh, in our third fund. And so that helped us to understand the ICO technology from kind of the inside out. And we brought liquidity to the venture capital industry, which has historically been uh, illiquid. And it's been a, a really interesting experience. We also did a, a SEC-compliant uh, ICO. So we had a, a bunch of firsts there. Um, happy to get into that and other topics uh, as we go. Thanks. And just to get the pronunciations correct, I'm David Blumberg. I'm the founder and managing partner of Blumberg Capital. And we are not those other guys, much more famous. They have more O's in their name and on their balance sheet. But, um, 
we, our fund is based in San Francisco, New York, and Tel Aviv, and we've invested in five or six countries around the world where we find great entrepreneurs, so don't let geography be a barrier to you. Um, we try and do seed and A rounds to lead and seed, and then come on in and follow on um, as the companies need more capital. Jeff received some of our largesse a while ago, and it's been doing well. Um, and we across, across all across invest across the IT spectrum. But this blockchain Bitcoin is very intriguing to us because we've done a lot in the enterprise software area and with fintech. So logically, they're pretty connected. I'll pause there and just say, all right, team, we've got some questions that are coming up. These, if you know how this works, these get voted up and, uh, higher and higher. So the ones that are eventually at the top are what most people want to know about. Why don't we start off with a few of the questions that we talked about earlier. Um, just because there's some very sophisticated investors in, in blockchain Bitcoin already, and there's some people who don't know much about it. So let's start off with, let's differentiate blockchain and crypto. How are they disrupting the status quo? and provide an example, one of your favorites. Why don't we just go from Jeff to Patrick to Elise to Bart. Well, one of my, one of my favorites is Ethereum. It's essentially creating a, a world computer that's completely distributed. So the code runs distributed, it, and it's, it's, uh, it's transparent. And I think that it's uh, uh, democratizing access to uh, contracts, smart contracts, to uh, applications. Uh, and, it, and it allows whole new types of organizations that are essentially governed by code. Yeah, so the, I think the most obvious example that we're seeing is, uh, is in capital raising and in fundraising. Uh, the blockchain, of course, is open, borderless, permissionless, transnational. And so this really creates a new tool for entrepreneurs all around the world to gain access to the capital markets. It's, inclu it's increasing financial inclusion in a way that we've never seen before. And this is really only the beginning. So we're seeing a lot of innovation in the form of traditional financial products being open up to more people. Other areas that we see a lot of innovation and disruption happening is in supply chain, uh, in uh, things like keeping track of health records, uh, sharing of resources such as CPU cycles and storage and all of these interesting things. And, and I would say that the most interesting and the most disruptive use cases are the ones that we haven't thought of yet, the ones that you're probably thinking about. And, uh, and those are the ones that get me excited to, to hear about the next day. Elise. So I'll share a response going back to the basics. Um, and I, I'm happy that Patrick mentioned uh, in financial inclusion. And the reason why uh, that's, that's possible is because what the blockchain essentially does is takes the ledger of record outside of the institution and democratizes access exactly as the prior two panelists have said by allowing individuals to commit transactions and essentially a historical record of ownership and transactions um, to a worldwide and transparent ledger. And so what that does is it, it, it disrupts a bit the power dynamic that's existed between institutions and individuals that keeps certain folks um, out of participating in the global economy and in financial institutions um, generally. And it kind of flips it on its head and says individuals themselves have, have access to their own resources and ability to own their own decisions in who they'll transact with. Um, where I think we'll see that be most disruptive and one of the reasons why I came into the ecosystem is exactly what Patrick referenced with financial inclusion. So rather than uh, call out one industry or company specifically, I'll say that where it'll be most disruptive is in who those of us in this room now have access to simply because our credit card company or financial institution no longer has to give us um, permission to transact. Um, instead, we can reach out and make the decision to do that ourselves. Yeah, I'd echo <clears throat> the capital raising comment. I've found that when I talk to my friends on Sand Hill Road at the legacy firms and the generalist firms, they love to talk about innovation and they love to talk about disruption unless it's aimed at their own industry, which is venture capital. Then they get really uncomfortable. Um, the truth is there's been $300 billion of liquid value created this year in blockchain-based assets. So that's token and Bitcoin and Ether and ICOs. And, um, and Sand Hill Road hasn't participated in any of it. Um, with a couple notable exceptions. And that money didn't come from New York or Chicago or the city of London or Hong Kong. Um, tokenized networks, so an ICO is just a transaction. That's like saying an IPO. Well, there's good IPOs and there's bad IPOs. There's good ICOs and bad ICOs. But if you're talking about a tokenized network, that is a powerful concept. That allows you to raise capital not from traditional sources of capital, 
from Sand Hill Road, but from your future users, from your future customers, evangelists, open source software developers can get paid for the first time. These are powerful concepts, and even though ICOs are controversial and kind of fun to talk about, the, what we're really talking about here is the more profound idea of tokenized networks. And it solves something that has vexed Silicon Valley for 40 years, which is the cold start problem. How do you get people to care about your network? So the person that opened up the first fax machine had a useless piece of technology. There's no one else to fax anything to. And, and network-based models like Facebook or eBay, they, sometimes they, ha they happen organically. But now you can increase the odds of that type of mega boom success by offering a financial incentive, by building your, your network around a tokenized network. And so the business of venture capital itself is being disrupted. And I think it's a big story that's not being told. Excellent. And I'll <clears throat> just add, as a venture capitalist who's not afraid of blockchain and Bitcoin, I want to embrace it. Chris Gottschalk, my colleague, you could raise your hand, is an expert. He's been investing personally, and I have too, um, for a while in the space. But our firm, it's, we're plagued, unfortunately. A lot of venture capital firms cannot invest in non-securities. So these guys pioneered the way forward, I think, and you know, kudos to you. I think you're going to see a lot of venture capital firms in our next funds open ourselves up to more possibilities to be able to invest in some of these new uh, styles. And there may be some new options uh, that, that Jeff and others are, are going to bring forward that'll maybe even make it easier. But there's a government, there's a uh, industry that's even bigger than venture capital. And I'm noticing here some of the things that are rising on um, Slido. Uh, one of them is the government. And not only the government, governments. And for example, think if you were a person with savings account in Cyprus a couple years ago. One night you woke up in the morning. You woke up in the morning, and your whole account had been frozen and taken by the government. I don't know why they needed it for taxes or something, but you know you'd be a high, hard-working Cypriot, and all of a sudden your money was just gone or frozen. That's the kind of thing that this technology is going to is coming as a response to, and I think it's going to disrupt governments acting badly, causing inflation, doing junk like that, uh, where they just expropriate. I think that's one of the big end goals here. Um, fi financial inclusion will mean governments can't take advantage of people as much in the future. Do you, any of you disagree with that? And then we can move on to the regulation question, which is the biggest piece we have right now in uh, terms of interest. So we'll talk about so regulation. David, I'll agree with you, and then I'll, I'll say this, that it, it's important as we move forward to um, rebalance power between individuals and institutions, including governments, um, that we don't replicate those same power structures in our own ecosystem of cryptocurrency and blockchain. Um, so the idea is to make sure that we're focused on self-sovereignty and distributed power, and we're, we're conscious of watching where uh, power consolidates or centralizes, which would be essentially a, a replication of a government-like institution. So having to ask permission is something that the blockchain removes, um, hopefully, from the equation going forward. Yeah, and in the governance piece, it really brings into question, there was a question that popped up earlier of what's going to stop governments from outlawing cryptocurrencies, and uh, the answer is nothing. Uh, governments can outlaw things as they see fit. Uh, the question becomes, what are the mechanisms for enforcing those laws? And uh, that is a very open question right now, because there's a lot of traditional means that governments have at their disposal that don't necessarily that leverage work in this environment. That's not to say that the overpower, the overarching power of the state does not exist because it absolutely does. Uh, you know, we, we all fear the SEC and the FBI and, you know, if you're a bad actor, you should fear these, uh, these institutions. But the real open question comes around things like taxes. And, uh, you know, this, this technology enables personal privacy and government transparency at the same time. And that's a fantastic thing. But there's a real open question of what will governments be able to do in the future uh, that they currently can do now that this technology makes obsolete and uh, you know, I, I, people you know, will essentially have a choice whether or not they choose to follow the rules and the regulations. So there's a lot of open questions. I think ultimately though, it's going to make societies much stronger. Yeah, I'd, I'd add that um, we've already seen what the, so we all use the internet every day. The internet, uh, as we know it, is really just the Internet of Information. And what we've seen in places like the Arab Spring is it, it, it makes it difficult for bad-acting governments to fool their populations. It, it, it erodes their democratic um, uh, hegemonic power. 
you can think of the blockchain as the internet of value, not the internet of information. And so I think we'll see a similar, similar parallel happen where bad actors, um, governments that are doing things like hyperinflation or expropriating bank accounts or devaluing their currency, um, with, I think the blockchain will be a destabilizing event to those types of, of, of levers. And, and people can vote with their feet and now they can vote with their, with their digital money. Um, and so, you know, it, this will present challenges to governments, but I think I will take a contrarian opinion that most governments see this as evil. I talk to regulators all the time at the SEC, at the DOJ, at the CFTC, um, and they actually are, are fairly constructive on this technology. What regulators have a dual mandate. One is to protect the consumers uh, and the system. The other is to be globally competitive. And so if the U.S., for example, overregulates this industry, the human capital and the financial capital will move to Singapore or it will move to Hong Kong, or the city of London, or Switzerland. And so the US regulators are, are mindful of these things, and, and they're more constructive than you might think. I, I totally agree, and most of you in this room, are, with a very, very few exceptions, are younger than me. So I'm old enough to, when I was a kid, there was a big um, regulation problem in the bond market in the United States, and we put some very onerous regulations, and the whole industry basically moved to London. And we lost this gigantic thing that's now called Euro bonds and so on. So you know, shame on us if we, regulate ourselves out of, <laughs> out of the game. The head of the Gibraltar Stock Exchange came to visit our office the other day, and he had a really interesting uh, way of thinking about regulation that they're proposing right now, and I'm curious about your regulation, your, your thoughts on it. His stock exchange is going to start regulating um, with a spe separate but related um, exchange for uh, cryptocurrencies, and they're going to relate on, on principles, not rules. They're going to put forth a bunch of, like, have like, like 11 commandments, and these commandments are, honesty, transparency, integrity, I mean, basic high-level stuff. But then they let the companies sort of figure it out on their own. But to keep everybody honest, the investment bankers, the brokers, anybody that's involved in this that get fees, get their fees paid in the same cryptocurrency that's being issued. Isn't that interesting? So it really has a, a, pr a premium on deal with integrity, and you're, they're locked up for, for a period of time. So I'm curious what you think, if you've seen any innovative regulatory models, because most of the regulatory models I see in the United States and Europe don't work very well. They generally get outdated because of technology or social demographic changes. So what do you think about the flexibility that this market will need? So, so I would say that um, <clears throat> you know, it turns out that uh, regulation is good in a lot of cases. And you know, w there were some hard lessons. You know, the 33 Act has some, you know, some, some wisdom in it. Is examples, and I think that um, uh, the ICO space and cryptocurrency has evolved so quickly that it's had to kind of relearn some of these things. But it, you know, it, it will it will learn them. Um, but you see places like Singapore. You know, they just published a paper last week, and really articulate and the things they're concerned about and the framework, and uh, I think regulators all over the world can benefit from, from seeing how they handled it. Gibraltar is being very progressive. Switzerland is is phenomenal. So I think you'll see, uh, you know, just as you choose to go to websites uh, on the internet that are of interest to you, you'll choose to do your value transactions in jurisdictions that accommodate you. Yeah, so I, I'll uh, echo what Bart said around the conversations that I've also had with regulators. The, uh, the sentiment is an understanding of the fact that they do not want to stifle entrepreneurship. At the same time, they do have a mandate to protect consumers, and uh, we absolutely need that. Uh, the uh, government of Singapore, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, did come out with some incredibly helpful guidance. Uh, they essentially gave several use cases of this would be regulated as a security, this would be, this would be, and this is what we consider a utility token and it would not be considered a security. That's what's currently missing from the United States and that's the type of guidance that would be extraordinarily helpful. Uh, look, we've done over 30 ICOs. We, we're, we're constantly uh, evaluating the regulatory regimes and the rules of the road. And here's the problems that we have. Uh, if it's a security, like what Blockchain Capital did, uh, then it's very clear. You can do Reg D, you can sell it to accredited investors. And by the way, I'm not a lawyer. None of this is legal advice. You need a lawyer if you're going to do this. Uh, Many. <laughs> uh, you can, you can follow the rules. You can do Reg D offerings. You can do Reg A. Uh, the problem comes with utility tokens. 
And utility tokens are these super interesting tokens that can facilitate a network, that can create new circular economies, that can do a lot of really fantastic things that the blockchain promises to deliver to us. However, if you're selling a utility token under Reg D, then your network can only include accredited investors. Or if you sell it under the Jobs Act, then it's not really, it's not equity. It doesn't give you voting rights. It doesn't give you dividends. Uh, so there's a lack of uh, clarity and there's a lack of pathway forward to do this in a compliant manner, which we all want to do. Uh, another question that was posed to the SEC last week and they did not answer is whether or not, uh, because a SAFT, uh, which is built on the SAFE uh, document, which is common here in Silicon Valley, is commonly used for token sales. And so the question was, can a asset go from being a security to a non-security in the case of a pre-functional utility token, which our policy is to treat as a security, can it in fact transition into something that is a commodity or a product? Uh, and there was, there was no answer on that. I think that the regulators are evaluating these questions and will hopefully be providing guidance and not just come down hard and uh, take the, the approach that the People's Bank of China did and just say no more. Uh, but these are the open questions that we'll, we need answered. Yeah, the, the challenge here for regulators and for all of us, and it really pisses off Jamie Dimon, is, is that this is something new. Um, Blockchain-based assets or cryptocurrencies, it's not a payment technology totally. It's not quite digital gold, which would be a commodity. It's not quite a security. It's not quite um, uh, uh, anything that... Not, instead of not quite, it's more than. It's Maybe it's more, more than. than. The truth is it doesn't fit in any neat bucket. Uh, my, my partner, Spencer, calls it a platypus. There was an argument in the 19th century with biologists on was a platypus an, an otter or a duck or uh, was it something else? And, and, and they finally just decided it's something new. They called it a platypus. So um, the challenge for the, for the regulators is it doesn't fit in the, the pre-existing categories. Could it, is it a category definer? It is something novel and new. So let, let's talk about the dark side, and I don't mean venture capital, come on. I'm, talk, I'm talking about the real things. You're, I'm taking it from you. You guys are leading this conversation. The money laundering, the fraud, the bubble, the Ponzi schemes, a uh, number of nice words that you all put up on here. Um, is there any self-regulatory way here? Do we need to be all caveat emptor, buyer beware? Is there some other best practices that we're seeing to protect that? And then I'm gonna ask a completely separate question about cybersecurity and hacking, because that's totally different. But just talk about the bad um, you know, Ponzi scheme, the bubble nature, the uh, money laundering, that aspect. So uh, this technology, just like the internet, is a, it's a reflection of our values as a society. And uh, there's a lot of good people out there, and unfortunately there's a lot of bad people out there. And uh, any truly transformational technology is gonna be accessible to both. I'm of the opinion that if you give this capability and you give these amazing abilities to the population as a whole, the good is going to outweigh the bad. That's my personal philosophy and hopefully that will come to fruition. Uh, in terms of the bad actors and the people who commit fraud and who launder money, uh, you know, I can speak specifically to the ICO space. We as a community, uh, do want to self-regulate and uh, uh, these conversations are already ongoing of best practices around governance, around disclosure, around lockup periods, around some of these simple things, how the money is going to be used uh, and requiring due diligence on all of these things and it's theoretically and hopefully will continue to make it harder for a bad actor to succeed. Uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of some of the other, you know, things like money laundering, I, you know, it's I don't have a I don't have a great solution for how to stop these types of things. Uh, what I will say, and I'm going to circle back to this, is that when you look at some of the root causes in society of the problems that we have, a lot of it has to do with financial inclusion. And if you're giving everybody in the world an opportunity to succeed and sit in a room with amazing, smart, brilliant people like this, if everybody has the same op level of opportunity, then we're gonna have a lot less problems in society. At least that's my, that's my theory. Elise, anything to add? Sure, so I suppose, of course, um, lower socioeconomic status people are not the folks doing money laundering, right? So. Right. Um, I guess I'll speak to that as it appears to be a popular topic um, on our on our advisory board. Um, so money laundering, Bitcoin blockchain is a really poor way to launder money. 
um, because no one can stop you from buying, you can't be stopped from buying Bitcoin, you can't be stopped from sending a transaction, but once you've sent that transaction or made a purchase, it's committed to a permanent record. And so if you're doing an, um, an illegal activity, of course you'd, you'd want to not have that committed to a transparent and permanent record. So Bitcoin blockchain would not be for you, I think, if you're, if you're planning to launder money. What's been really interesting is that I've seen industries um, that frankly are used to launder money um, being kind of quick to realize that blockchain technology is going to be something that's disruptive to their, their practice of laundering money and wanting to institute proactively their own kind of closed and private blockchains to, to protect their business um, or to protect their practice. Um, against disruption by public blockchains. So perhaps this is a way to push back against these type of activities by having, activi uh, by having financial transactions on a public ledger of record. Can you name the industries where you've seen this go on I, think I shouldn't, I suppose. Name the industries, I think you should, not the companies. I'll, I'll, I'll skip that. All right. Um, but I, I'm sure I'm that give it's... give you value for your hard-earned money here. I, the crowd I'll, wants to know, right? You want to know? I'll take the, I'll take the bubble one. Um, so if you're in the blockchain technology industry or you're involved in Bitcoin, you get asked this question a lot. Um, and so I've had to go and do research on bubbles and all the way back to Tulips and the South Sea India Company and the, the dot-com 1.0 bubble all the way up to the 2008 financial crisis. And what you see is a bunch of commonalities. Number one, you see the presence of levered financial incumbents. So the big money guys lever up and they cause problems. It's like we saw that in 2008 in a galactic way. Um, and and what you don't see in this industry is the usual suspects. So we went out and did a survey. We talked to 2,500 Americans, and I've been going around the world talking to banks and financial institutions and raising capital for our funds and uh, hedge funds and billionaires and family offices, and I can tell you that none of the usual suspects are along this stuff. So if it is a bubble, it is unlike other bubbles in that the traditional financial players are not involved. This would be the first bubble in history where essentially it is totally retail driven and banks and institutions and financial firms essentially do not have a position. And so perhaps it's a bubble, it's hard to predict asset prices, but if so, it'd be a new type of bubble. And what we also found out in our survey is that this is a kind of a generational movement. We went out and we found out that we asked all these millennials, people that were actually 18 to 35, and then even going up to people in their 40s, and, and we found some interesting results. It turns out that if you talk to millennials, one in three millennials would rather own Bitcoin than a government bond, stocks, um, or a commodity like gold, or even real estate. Um, we thought that was fascinating. And, and, and so what we think is happening here is it's the emergence of a new asset class and it's not held by the traditional holders of, of traditional assets. And we also asked these younger people, um, why do you like this stuff? And what institutions do you, are you more inclined to believe or what, what financial um, methods? And, and when you, if you ask them, do you trust JP Morgan or Bank of America or Goldman Sachs versus Bitcoin, like 40% of them trust this globalized network of computers called the blockchain and the asset that sits on top uh, called Bitcoin compared to the largest financial institutions in this country. So our conclusion is that young people are interested in this new technology. They think it is outside the system, and they don't trust the traditional system. This is a protest vote of sorts. It, cool. If I could just add on that. Quick. I completely agree. I want to point out that most people are young. You know, the U.S. is older population, Europe's older population, but 50% you know, of the population of India is under 25. And, and most of the wealth creation, most of the people are outside the US. And, and, and you know, that's one of the reasons that this will be a bubble. We're not in a bubble yet. There's two types of bubbles. There's asset bubbles and there's technology bubbles. And this is, we're scratching the surface. There's no institutional investors. There's no leverage. There's very few retail. And it's the whole asset class, and it is an asset class, is like $300 billion. That's a pimple. You know, private equity is $2 trillion. Marketable securities is $100 trillion. As some of those traditional sources start to move into this asset class, there will be a bubble. It will bring down countries. But we're, we're so early. It's like 1993 okay. on the internet. The, the, the crowd wants us to talk about deploying capital. I still have this question on the table, though, about cybersecurity. Some of you have heard of Tether. It was a big famous attack there. The Dow. There were other ones, not D-O-W, D-A-O. Um, and there were others. Um, anybody want to hold forth on cybersecurity related to this world? People steal stuff from traditional financial institutions every day. It just doesn't get reported. 
Um, what we see in the blockchain technology sector is people are not hacking the base protocol. They're stealing assets or Bitcoin or Ether or tokens from a centralized custodian. So that is a crime and bank robberies happen across the country and around the world every day. So that would kind of be the analogy. But we haven't seen hacking at the protocol level. The Bitcoin blockchain and the Ethereum blockchain have essentially never been hacked. They have close to 100% uptime. So these are very robust decentralized systems that are ultra secured. There have been in, uh, you know, individual bad actors and, and hackers going after uh, individual Bitcoin exchanges. But again, that happens every day in the real world. It's just financial institutions absorb those losses and they don't talk about them. But OK, so I think it's important if you're an investor in cryptocurrencies to recognize that um, the strength of the Bitcoin blockchain or Ethereum blockchain um, isn't necessarily representative of the strength of other protocols. And so, um, you know, certainly true that a protocol could be hacked or could have bugs that impact um, your ability to store value on them. And we've seen this recently. There was um, a, a hard fork of the Bitcoin blockchain that was proposed called 2X through the NYA agreement that um, at launch essentially demonstrated that there were bugs that dispermitted um, the survival of that protocol. So if, that, if a bug like that had occurred three months down the line and you had value on that protocol, your value, of course, would be at risk. And so what's important to note here is that the engineering teams, the open source software developers, are absolutely critical to the protocol. And understanding the strength of those teams and kind of doing your diligence on the teams that commit to the open source code of these protocols is, is absolutely critical before you invest in an associated cryptocurrency. Perfect segue into the biggest bubble right here, not bubble, but the biggest word cloud piece is deploying capital. So where should we be deploying capital? Where should they and we be deploying capital, uh, both in sectors, and you can even throw out a, a name if you like it, if you're, it's your portfolio company or somebody else's that you would really admire. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with that one. Uh, you should deploy it where you understand it. And you should also deploy it in a way that if you uh, lose it all, that it's not going to make you broke. This is very simple, uh, but there is a lot of uh, talk out there. There are a lot of big ideas with not a lot of substance underneath them. And so it is very important that you understand what it is that you are putting your money into, uh, because uh, otherwise, you know, that, that's, that's the most important piece. Any particular domains you like, um, Bart? So we're constructive on Bitcoin. We're constructive on Ether. We also think that investing in the equity of the companies that are building the bridges and roads and tunnels, if you will, of this ecosystem makes sense. That's the job I'm in, so I'm talking my book for full disclosure. Um, and, and I think being an educated investor is great. The only other thing I'd add it is diversification. We talk to young engineers all the time and entrepreneurs, and they come up and they're like, I have 100% of my net worth in Bitcoin. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, that's crazy. You shouldn't have 100% of your net worth in anything. You should have some cash and some real estate and maybe some Bitcoin if you're young and super aggressive, but uh, don't put all of your eggs in, in a super volatile basket. Yeah, and I, I would say um, you know, take an evening, don't go out to dinner, take that $100 and go like, buy some cryptocurrency, put it on your, your, you know, your UBS drive, you know, buy an ICO, just like move the $100 around and try to understand it. Uh, you're going to lose it. You're going to make a mistake because we're still like at the dot prompt. It's, this stuff is so hard still. But y you'll, you start to think like, wow, if I can do this, then you could do that. And you realize how big this is. And I would say just start there. Like, you know, buy one less round of drinks next time you go out and blow it all on cryptocurrency and you'll learn a ton. <laughs> and, and if you put it on a thumb drive and you have children, do not put the two in the same place because your Bitcoin millions may go off into some, you know, mud pile somewhere. T teachable uh, moment. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think we have like a minute left. Let's take maybe one question from out, out in the ether. This ether. Anybody want to ask a question? Just raise your hand and you can shout. No brave questioners. All right, then we'll just be brave. Oh, here's a gentleman. Yes, you got a prize. <laughs> Okay, most interesting use cases of the blockchain, right, that we've not yet heard about. Great question. Crypto kitties. <laughs> <laughs> and what, you have to say why. Uh, that, was, that was sarcastic. That's not the most interesting. Uh, 
Although it, it, it is interesting in its own right in that it does have value. And, uh, you know, and, and I'll just go ahead and kind of jump into this question around uh, the limitations of the Ethereum network. Uh, yes, it, you know, anytime there's a, uh, the Ethereum network has the ability to scale. You could think of it as like, uh, you could think of it as like cornstarch, if you've ever used this. It's a substance where if you punch it, it stops cold. Uh, but if you move slowly, you can go right through it. In the same way, the network doesn't do very well with spikes, uh, large large ICOs, these types of things, but it does have the ability to scale gradually. I don't think that that's going to be a problem. It, it will continue to scale. Yeah. Um, I, I, I like the use case of fake news. With a blockchain, you can prove the providence of information. Uh, and in a, in a financial services environment, knowing that your information is accurate is, is useful and profitable. In a democracy, it's critical. So I think that you're going to see micropayments combined with information dissemination in ways that we can't even conceive yet. And I like the idea, I like the use case. You've heard of it, but just for financial services, making transactions faster, as fast as the speed of lightning, much cheaper, much easier, much more inclusive for poor folks so they don't have to have very expensive remittances and all that, really can make things a lot more seamless in the financial services world, uh, you know, tracking assets and uh, equities and all that kind of thing. It'll just really make things a lot better. So that's the revolution I'm excited about on the blockchain side of the world. Yeah, I'll chip in and say um, identity management. I mean, Equifax barfed out 153 million social security numbers all over the internet. That's most of us in this room. And so I think identity management and identity theft is a huge problem here in the US. And as the rest of the world comes online and gains more wealth, it's going to be a global problem. And I think blockchain technology and, 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 and some tokenization efforts that are already underway um, uh, could take a meaningful dent out of, out of a huge problem that's going to increasingly touch all of our lives. And, and just in closing, I would say, you know, it's coming to the year end, stock market's at an all-time high. Take Jeff's advice. Take 100 bucks. Do something in crypto this year before the year's out. I think when you look back on it 10, 20 years from now, you'll remember where you were at this lunch when you first dipped your toe in the water. And you might lose it, but, you know, maybe split into two or three different things. And just try it. Get a little bit wet. It's going to be a great ride. Thanks. Thanks to the panelists.